Are things actually changing for Palestine? I think a lot of people have been marching for the last six months or posting about the genocide every day and asking themselves if any of this is making a difference. And the answer is yes, absolutely. The death toll is obviously still climbing, and the protesters haven't achieved their main demands yet, but if you look objectively at what's actually happened these last six months, it's clear that the political crisis in Washington has left the US relationship with Israel in the most fragile place it's ever been. Things that we once thought were impossible are now actually happening, and this is all tremendously favorable for the struggle of the Palestinian people. The first big shift is in public opinion. Historically, Americans have supported Israel by a huge margin. An analysis of 260 Gallup polls dating back to 1967 found that for the last many decades, Americans supported Israel by a margin of around 4 to 1, but the last six months have turned this trend on its head. A poll taken in March of 2024 found that the majority of Americans now disapprove of Israel's actions in Gaza, a virtual reversal from where those numbers stood in November of 2023. This includes 75% of Democrats and 60% of Independents. Another poll taken in late March found that the majority of Americans are now against sending more military aid to Israel. This is especially significant because without US military aid, Israel would run out of ammo within a matter of weeks and its military operations would come to a halt. Polls show that people in the the UK, another major arms supplier for Israel, now also want to end weapons sales to Israel. This shift is also largely coming from young people. While Israel's favorability has fallen across all age groups, among young people it's fallen 26%. And it's the Zionists who are afraid of this more than anyone. Audio from elite Anti-Defamation League call, which is a Zionist organization that seeks to equate anti-Zionism with anti-Semitism, their CEO Jonathan Greenblatt was caught freaking out about how many young people were waking up to Israel's true nature. This is also why the Israel lobby is now invested in the attempt to ban TikTok. TikTok, if yes. you will, oh. it is the is the 24-7 news channel of so many of our young people, and it's like Al Jazeera on steroids. Another huge development is the return of a mass movement for Palestine. We've seen record-setting marches in the last six months, including the march of half a million people in Washington, D.C., the largest protest march in Canadian history. The U.K. also had a few marches with over a million people, which is crazy when you can Consider this is 1.5% of the population. There were also massive marches in Iraq, Yemen, Indonesia, Pakistan, Cuba, France, Turkey. What the last six months have made clear is that the vast majority of people living on this planet right now support Palestine. But what's arguably more significant than the size of the protests is their targeted and sustained nature. I can't remember any movement in recent memory that's been so effective at denying politicians the ability to speak uninterrupted. Protesters have been disrupting genocide supporting politicians so consistently that even the biggest media outlets in the country can't ignore it anymore. It's gotten so bad that the Biden campaign has basically said it can't set foot on a college campus, and they even have to resort to doing background checks on the people buying tickets to private fundraising events to prevent these disruptions. These protests have also inspired organizing and vocal dissent within Biden's own staff, Congress, and executive departments, which has been called, by all accounts, unprecedented. Right now, Joe Biden actually has the lowest approval rating of any president since World War II. There's a very real chance that Palestine could be the decisive issue of a US presidential election, which who would have ever thought that? And now, nearly 600,000 people have voted uncommitted or cast some other kind of protest vote instead of voting for Biden in the Democratic primaries, which is about 10% of the total vote. Of the five states that Biden flipped in 2020, Two of these states, Michigan and Wisconsin, have seen the number of uncommitted votes close to or way beyond the difference that Biden won these states by in 2020. Following the Wisconsin primary, wealthy Democratic donors wrote a memo urging the Democratic establishment to take this movement seriously. It said, quote, We can tell you that the energy behind uncommitted isn't something that should be ignored, taken lightly, or dismissed. All these indicators of U.S. isolation at home and abroad have had a clear impact on how the struggle is playing out. On October 7th, Biden said his support for Israel was, quote, rock solid and unwavering. Even in early March, Biden said in an interview that there was no red line for U.S. support for Israel. Not even a month later, Biden told Netanyahu that the U.S. would have to reconsider its support for Israel if Israel didn't change course. Two days later, Nancy Pelosi, a total backer of Israeli apartheid, joined 55 other members of Congress with a letter to end future weapons sales to Israel if Israel continued to kill civilians. Benjamin Netanyahu said himself that what's happening right now is his worst fear. 
He said in a private meeting that his greatest fear was that the mass protests in Western capitals would create so much political pressure that it would disrupt weapons shipments from the U.S. The Biden administration also abstained from vetoing the ceasefire resolution presented to the UN Security Council, which enraged Israel so much that they canceled a diplomatic trip to the United States. For as long as the US-Israel relationship has existed, US military and diplomatic support for Israel was basically considered a given. To quote Nancy Pelosi, If this capital crumbled to the ground, the one thing that would remain is our commitment to our aid I don't even call it aid, our cooperation with Israel. But in just the last six months, half a century of this special relationship is coming into question. Now, I know a bunch of you are probably already leaving comments about how the US government doesn't actually care about Palestinians and this is all just political theater, not a real change of heart. And we agree. And that's kind of the point. Biden and the US definitely don't want to do this. If it was up to them, they would support Israel forever as a permanent US fortress in the region. But the movement for Palestine has put everything, whether it's Biden's re-election or the legitimacy of the empire, into question. And that's really what the point of protest is. Protests aren't meant to convince the ruling classes to wake up to their moral senses. Protests are meant to create such a deep political crisis for the ruling class that they have no choice but to change their policy. It was exactly this kind of political pressure that made the US genocidal occupation of Vietnam politically untenable. That's also why these politicians will say things that sound good to trick people into thinking they're going to stop supporting Israel without actually changing their policy. They'll do whatever they can to get the protests to stop without having to fundamentally change their policy. Now, it goes without saying that more needs to be done because the US is still supporting the genocide. But at the same time, we should remember that Israel is the US's most important strategic ally. It was never going to end its relationship with Israel without a massive fight. The US and Israel would love nothing more than for the world to fall into this idea that nothing is changing, that protests don't work, and that the US will never stop supporting Israel. They'd love it because they know that right now, their imperial project is the weakest it's ever been. But whether or not the pressure continues and creates a deep enough crisis for imperialism is up to us. On October 6, the outlook for Palestine looked bleak. The US had been spearheading a diplomatic deal with major Arab countries where they would normalize relations with Israel one by one. This deal, called the Abraham Accords, overturned a decades-long policy of Arab countries refusing to recognize Israel in solidarity with Palestine. Morocco, the UAE, Bahrain, and Sudan betrayed Palestine one by one, recognizing Israel and establishing diplomatic relations with it. Saudi Arabia was also planning to join the agreement in September, which would have fully normalized Israel's presence in the region and constituted a major blow to the Palestinian cause. On top of this, Gaza had already been facing a slow motion genocide for years. In 2018, the UN issued a report saying Gaza would be unlivable by 2020. Since 2006, Israel had been enforcing a total blockade of Gaza, completely preventing it from building or repairing infrastructure. Even before October 7th, 97% of Gaza's water was undrinkable, people in Gaza received about four hours of electricity a day, and Gaza was on the brink of famine, and no one was doing anything. The October 7th counteroffensive completely obliterated the normalizing Abraham Accords and made Palestine the central issue facing the world today. A recent poll taken in Palestine showed that despite the endless atrocities that the Palestinian people have faced, 64% of Palestinians still believe that they'll emerge from this genocidal onslaught victorious. Part of their calculation is that the people of the world will continue to stand with them. So remember that the next time you're having any doubts.